appreciative to see all of you here tonight. Uh, some familiar faces, some new ones that we hope you'll come back again, uh, not only to some of our adult programming that we do here at the museum, but also to the museum itself. Uh, you only have another 11 months or so before we're not here anymore. We're not going anywhere far. We're jumping to the other side of the National Mall to a brand new building. Uh, we're reconceptualizing the museum and we're excited moving forward. Uh, but we hope you come back and check us out on another day. Uh, we're particularly happy to have with us tonight our guest who I've spent some time with today. Uh, she, sometimes they just show up and you meet them for the first time and then you're introducing them like you've known them for years. And it's a little disingenuous, but we got a chance to talk, a chance to get to know each other a little bit, and I can truly say how much of a pleasure it's going to be tonight to have a conversation with you with Michelle Rigby Assad, who is a former undercover officer in the CIA and the Director of Operations. She was trained as a counterterrorism specialist, and she served her country for 10 years, working in Iraq and other places around the Middle East. Uh, upon retirement from active service, she and her husband, Joseph, who is here as well, I'll let, if he wants to call himself out, he can. If not, he can, you know, ex-CIA, you never know, right? Um, who was also a former CIA, joined a group of Americans who wished to aid persecuted Christians, and their efforts resulted in the evacuation of a group from northern Iraq that was featured on ABC's 2020 in December of 2015. She holds a master's degree from right up the street in contemporary Arab studies from Georgetown University. And today she serves in several roles, but as an international security consultant, splitting her time between the Middle East, Florida, where we found out that we're quasi neighbors down there. She's I'm from South, she's from Central Florida, and then here in Washington, DC. So welcome, Michelle, and thank you for taking the time to talk to us here at the Spy Museum. Thank you so much. It's really exciting to be here. I've never been here before either. Well, she'll have to come back again. <laughs> um, and not because she has a new book. And if you don't know, I think you do, because you're here. She's the author of Breaking Cover. And the subtitle of this is interesting, and we'll talk a lot about this moving forward. But this idea of my secret life in the CIA, and, and this is the key point, what it taught me about what's worth fighting for. Uh, and this will be a concurrent theme throughout this talk, because Unlike a lot of other memoirs, and we've had a lot of people who have written memoirs after their lives in the CIA, this really kind of gets down to that fundamental question about motivation. And motivation is something that we always talk about here at the Spy Museum. Usually it's why did someone sell out their country or money or other things, but sometimes motivation to give up your life for a cause, whether it's working for an intelligence community or something completely different. So let, let's start with that basic concept that we ask a lot of people who are formers. And the answer usually is, I wanted to be a CIA agent since I was 15 years old, or I was in college, or I grew up wanting to be a spy. You're the polar opposite of that. You had no intention whatsoever of joining the CIA until very late in your, let's say late in your life, because you're not even late in your life yet, but very late <laughs> in your career choices moving forward. I wanted to be a ballerina. <laughs> kind of like the CIA, <laughs> but uh, actually I, di I didn't even know growing up that, um, this, that being a spy or being an intelligence officer was a real job, so it would have never entered my mind to consider su such a career thrust. Well, and, and you almost got dissuaded from the very beginning because you applied to the agency, and for those who are of the generation of the 60s and 70s and the 80s, there's a lot of these conversations about I was recruited in a dark alley for the CIA. Now you go to CIA.gov and you apply online. Well, you had applied not for the director of operations, which you eventually would work for, but as an analyst for so, CIA. Yeah. So actually, I didn't know what I was applying to. <laughs> I just threw, this was the old days where yeah. you put your physical resume into a box. And this was at Georgetown, and they had done a, an informational interview. And I was putting my resume into every single box for every job. <laughs> and so I was really surprised when a, a recruiter called me three weeks later and said, we're interested in you for an analyst position. And I was like, OK, great. And went, started going through that very intensive uh, vetting process. And they eventually said, we'd love for you to be an analyst, but, but. then. <laughs> but then, a couple weeks before I was supposed to start that job, I got a rejection letter in the mail saying that you no longer qualify for this position as an analyst, as if I'd done something to jeopardize this job. Right, not why you didn't qualify anymore, not why all of a sudden you didn't qualify anymore. No indications. So it wasn't that you, you know, ran the stop sign or you know, <laughs> yeah. didn't wait long enough. You turned right on red in DC. That's problematic. You can't do that around here. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and you really fell into the DC trap that many in this room may understand is at that level where you have a, an advanced degree, you want a job that's doing something that's worthwhile, yeah. but every job requires what you didn't have. 
experience. And how do you get experience? Exactly. Get that job, <laughs> right? <laughs> this vicious cycle here. Yes, and um, for me it was so frustrating. I mean, DC is such an interesting place and it's full of really interesting and accomplished people. And so tight, lots of type A personalities. Everybody's got a job but me, or so it felt like yeah. anyway. You know, why can't I get a job? And part of the rejection letter, they told you you couldn't apply back to CIA mm -hmm. for a year. Correct. So you're looking in other directions, but at the same time, you had not only a family friend, but a family member, your spouse, was looking at CIA with an entirely different directorate right. at this point. Yes. So a friend uh, we were having dinner with, uh, he said, you know, there's actually this other side of the CIA, and this is the cool side. <laughs> Apologize if there are any analysts in this room right now. <laughs> in his in his description, this is a cool side. It's the clandestine operations, and this this is where it's at. Like we got to do this, and so my husband Joseph was like, "Oh yeah," and I could not conceptualize myself in such a role. I mean, I didn't know what does a spy look like. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, in pop culture doesn't help. No, no. Right. You you don't have twenty seven costumes, and you're not jumping out of airplanes, and you're not that yeah. kind of perception. But what's interesting, a lot of people don't have this opportunity is because your friend and your husband started this program, you weren't told everything about what was going on because that's a big no-no. Right. But you at least got to see that they came back from their training without missing limbs <laughs> and without being brainwashed or psychological trauma, right. at least not more than normal. Um, and you were able to kind of demystify the director of operations a little bit before yeah. you went down that path. Right, and so the, the training process, um, people are getting cut left and right because not only do you have to pass all of the training exams, but they just have to be sure like you've got the constitution required for this kind of a, a high pressure job. One thing I found interesting, Good thing it wasn't my phone going off. No one needs to hear young MC's classic busted move <laughs> playing in the middle of our, our conversation. Um, was that they just didn't know who you were because when your husband, because of his bio, was a natural fit for the director of operations. But the minute he told them about you, they're like, well, geez, of course. Like, let's call, because you have the background, mm -hmm. the languages to a degree, yeah. and you're exactly what they were looking for, but it had to be brought to their attention. Right, So right. maybe they don't know everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so he, they get two for one. So two Arabists, my husband's a native speaker of Arabic, originally from the Middle East, and so he really was perfect. And I looked at him, I'm like, you're clearly perfect for this. Um, and so then when he said, I have a wife, and she also has that same expertise that CIA was interested. Yeah. Well, the husband-wife thing is, is a win-win for everyone. It's a yeah. win for the agency, not just because of logistical reasons, but also because the husband-wife team, it's a lot less obvious than a military-age male walking around the Middle East to go, right. oh, there's a spy. Exactly. Um, you know, you're a couple instead. And at the same time, it's great because a lot of the problems, especially psychological problems and intimacy problems that case officers run into is the fact that they can't tell those closest to them yeah. what they do on a day-to-day. -day. Even if their wife is cleared to a degree, sure. you still can't have those in-depth conversations. But because you were working side some, by side, and sometimes on the exact same operations, right. you could actually be intimate with the person that you're most emotionally intimate with anyway. Right, exactly. And, and so that was so useful because, you know, who knows you better than your spouse, right? So they're the best, uh, I mean, having Joseph help me plan for an operation and think through all of the, you know, potential things that could go wrong, um, how, providing counter uh, surveillance support for each other's operations. I mean, I felt so confident with Joseph behind me because I trusted him more than anybody. Well, I mean, and that's the key is that you have to trust those you're working with. Oh, yeah. Because your lives are in their, literally, your lives can be, especially in the Middle East, yeah. your lives are in the hands. And that built-in trust is already there. It's not like you have to go out drinking together right. to, to, <laughs> to learn about that, your partner, right? to develop yeah. that. Yeah. But the CIA, you talk about what they're looking for. And, and you, you lay this out in the book, and, and I think it's done very, very well. Walking contradictions, right? The idea is, you have to be completely honest because the CIA needs to trust you, but you're being sent overseas to lie to everyone, including you're lying to your family and you're lying to your friends about the fact that, oh, I'm a diplomat, I'm the second deputy agricultural attache for the US <laughs> embassy, I'm the minister of shrubberies for the embassy overseas, <laughs> but instead you're actually working for the agency. And at the same time, you have to be honest, mm -hmm. 
you have to make sure you haven't broken the law because rolling through a stop sign can sometimes even stop background checks, but you're being sent overseas to break the law of any country that you go into because yeah. As far as I know, there's no countries in the world that espionage is not against the law. Right, exactly. So they have to be sure when they're hiring you that you're not going to pose a threat to the United States as a potential du double agent. And so they want honesty and they want integrity. And at the same time, they're asking you to break laws in other countries. Right. So it's a, a wild contradiction. To me, one of those interesting contradictions, and this is because pop culture has set such a crazy standard for what operations are, is the fact that there's not an operation, whether it's going to be a 30-minute brush or an hour-long meet, that doesn't take days, if not weeks, of preparation beforehand. Planning routes, planning you know, surveillance detection runs, planning all these things from top. And of course, you don't see that in Bond or Homeland or anything, but that would be a really boring movie. It's like, let's talk about paperwork for a week. <laughs> but all that goes into planning, and that's one part of this juxtaposition. But the other side is, it never works that way. <laughs> Right. right. I mean, not, you know, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. So you have to be a meticulous planner, yep. but be able to be very, very agile on your feet at the same time. Yeah, you have to respond to Murphy, who always shows up in an operation. Murphy's law. Anything that can go wrong will. And so you plan for all these contingencies, and then something always pops up that you, you can't anticipate. And so um, that's why it's so hard for the agency to hire, because they're looking for people who are meticulous planners, but who can then change an operation on the fly based on circumstances. So and, and operate under this intense pressure, because not only is your life on the line, but your source's life. You're, you're having a clandestine, or you're planning for a clandestine meeting, but if you bring surveillance to that meeting, you could get your source killed. So there's definitely a lot on the line. You talked about how you were a natural recruit for CIA because of your background and your knowledge of the area and because of the, the ability to have some Arabic. I mean, I'm saying some Arabic because you're, you're very self-depreciating <laughs> about your level of Arabic in the book. Don't but, ask Joseph about my <laughs> Arabic. <laughs> but even though you're a natural fit, you still had to go through the process of yeah. Oh, yeah. the polygraph and the psyche valve and all the training at that place. You can't say, but I can say as the farm down in Virginia. Um, but the psyche valve in the polygraph examination for anyone like me, I grew up Catholic. Um, taught at a Catholic school, I uh, was married to the Catholic Church. I am ingrained with this. I'm guilty if I think about thinking about doing something I'm not supposed to do. Because you've essentially and, committed that sin just right, by considering just, yes, it by in considering, your mind. considering considering it. Yeah. <laughs> and you talk about that a little in the book, where some, some cultures or some, some backgrounds are naturally inclined to be really, really bad at these kind of examinations because mm -hmm. I may have, when I was 10 years old, looked at a pack of baseball cards and be like, I don't have enough money to get that. What if I just grab it? And they go, no, 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 I'm not going to grab it. But I'll feel guilty about thinking about <laughs> grabbing that. So in my subconscious, I stole the pack of baseball cards. Yeah, and that polygraph would have gone wild oh, if you'd been questioned about it. My polygraphs yeah. go like this. <laughs> um, I have a lot of explaining to do afterwards. But with, in your case, uh, you have somewhat similar experience. And of course, taking the box for the first time when they say, relax, and then they start putting electrodes places, and then other <laughs> sensors, other places. Um, did you find that that was overwhelmingly onerous, just the kind of oh. idea of, of trying to convince yourself to calm down and then convince them that you had nothing to hide? Yeah, and I, you know, they ask you so many different questions, like, have you ever mishandled classified information? I'm like, what's classified information? <laughs> and so when they tell you things like, well, the polygraph went wild on the question of, have you ever broken into <laughs> a computer system? And I'm like, OK, now I know you're lying, <laughs> because I have no idea how to basically log into my computer. Yes. So, <laughs> no. so they ask you all kinds of questions. You're hooked up. You've got sensors all over the place, and they go, just relax. Right. <laughs> Not and then psyche valves are always fun. It's like, would you rather kick your dog or your cat? Yeah, I know. And what does no. that say about yeah. you? What does yeah. it say about you? Mm -hmm. One thing that's an underlying theme in this book that I, I thought um, that came across in all the right ways in your face. And I, I, I'm not saying that it was overwhelming. I think that needs to be pushed in people's faces is the, the perception of women within the intelligence world. And it's a recurring theme throughout the book, and it's something that, that we should need to be taken more seriously uh, than we certainly do. And this started right in the beginning of your training yes. to, to work at CIA. Um, and your training officer 
maybe hadn't seen a woman before in his life. I don't know what the deal was, but can you explain a little bit about your first impressions of CIA? Yes, yeah, so my, my instructor had, was a legend at the CIA, and he was retired. And he told me uh, at one point, I don't remember which point that was, that he had only known women as secretaries. And he kept saying, are you sure you want to get into operations? And I'm like, well, I don't, I think so. Um, but when he would sit, so it was my, myself and another male colleague, and we would sit in the room, this tiny little space together, and he would face my colleague the entire time. He would never look at me. And so that was my introduction to being a, a female at the CIA. And you, could, you chalk it up to a degree in the book about this is an old guy thinking about back in the day. Mm -hmm. But it's, is it fair to say things haven't dramatically changed? Not all so, that much, yeah. unfortunately. Because yeah. the perception is still there yeah. about the abilities, especially when it comes to the Middle East. Yes. Is there is that perception at the agency that some jobs are, are better suited for men dealing with Arabs and Middle Eastern counterterrorism, for example? Right, because you're dealing with people that are from very paternalistic cultures. So um, when Joseph and I started working at the CIA, they said, you know, your husband should really do that that sketchy, that the dicey field work, and you should remain, you know, inside the office. Because as a female, you're just not going to be able to connect with these uh, Middle Eastern male sources. That a lot of whom are terrorists. And I, I thought, OK, well, they're the CIA. They must know. Um, but yet, the CIA gave us all this amazing training to do operations. And all throughout the training, we kept being, being told, you'll get to do everything your husband does. You'll just have a little bit more you know, office time. Um, but I found it very strange that when I got into the field, that other individuals who knew nothing about the Middle East had never traveled there before. We were in Iraq, didn't know the difference between Sunni and Shia, didn't understand the sectarian strife that was going on. And I thought, I'm sorry, so my male colleague who knows nothing about the Middle East is going to do a better job at this than I would? Huh. And it's a double standard that you see in the civilian world, too, that you saw all the time where men who do a specific thing are considered assertive. Yeah. And women are called a different word <laughs> for that same thing. And in your personality, you're, you know, We've known each other for a couple hours, and they've seen you for 10 minutes, but they can tell you're, you're easygoing, you're open, you're smiley, you're, you have a great personality. Thank but you. people may perceive that, and they have perceived that, as you're naive, yes. or you're stupid, or you're bubbly, and yeah. underestimate your capabilities. Yes. I mean, I don't know what it is. I'm sure I'm not the only one in the room. If you're friendly, if you're empathetic, if, if you're um, smiley, People think you're stupid. Not everyone. But there's this perception that you can't be driven or have and be incredibly determined or have grit. And um, they don't see what's inside of you. And so they have to see you in action. They actually have to watch you in motion. And so though it took me a long time to prove to both myself and my colleagues that not only did I have what it took, but that I could be really, really good at it, once they finally saw me in the debriefing room and the results, the intelligence I was able to collect, it was like an aha moment for all of us. And what's wonderful is that you were able to use these biases against them. Yes. You know, take advantage of them underestimating you. Yes. Especially in this, some cases, Middle Eastern men, terrorists, yes. who would look at you as a sex object the minute you walked in the room. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you know of anything about debriefing or interrogation, the number one thing you want to do is put your subject off guard, <laughs> is kind of give them something to think about that's not you know, trying to stop you from getting the information that you're getting. Right. And you had that built in. Yeah, lucky me. <laughs> yeah, and, and so, the, you know, turning people's biases against them, and you mentioned the book, and you have a long passage about a OSS, the eventually CIA female case officer by the name of Virginia Hall. Yes. Who she's is awesome. someone that you've looked up to kind of as a model for your experience at CIA. Yes. Oh, she was a spy uh, during World War II, but this is after having applied to the State Department three times and getting rejected for being a female and for having shot off the bottom part of her leg and having a peg leg. So they told her, you're not able-bodied, so therefore you could never be a diplomat. Well, eventually Virginia Hall became one of the best spies of World War II because she used that peg leg to pose as a farmhand or an old lady. And the Nazis could not figure out where she was and what she was doing. They knew she existed, 
They did not figure out she was American. They didn't know her true identity. And she operated behind enemy lines. I'll give you an example. She was a radio operator. And because the counterintelligence threat was so high from the Nazis, radio operators only lasted six weeks before they were killed. She lasted two years. And if you want to see her radio, her actual radio, it's about a floor above us right now. So wow. just throw that That's at you. so cool. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> um, so we're very happy that you like Virginia Hall. Um, well, let me ask you about your first tour, because you joined CIA. You think you're going to travel to these wonderful places in the world, maybe the Virgin Islands, or you might get sent to Australia. Maybe you're going to be in the British, uh, the British station. You got sent somewhere. Actually, the CIA won't even let us know where you got sent, but it certainly wasn't the, the British island. The, sorry, the no, British no, Islands. it was not the Caribbean. Yes. No. <laughs> and this is where you had a somewhat interesting experience, I'm using that somewhat as euphemism, with your first boss, who seemed to have some of the similar ideas that you'd run into during training. Yes. So, you know, here we were. We sold our house in Alexandria. We sold our car. We either gave away or packed up all our belongings. We said goodbye to our family and close friends and essentially gave up our civilian lives, traveled to the edge of the world, and my boss essentially greeted us by cursing at us. That, that had to be taken out of the book. <laughs> cursing at us for several minutes and saying, don't mess this up, and then not speaking to us for about three or four months. And then you'd trained as something called a collection management officer, which you'd known about. It wasn't something you got shoved into. And this is not like a secondary job. It's an incredibly important job at CIA. Very cool job. You're the yeah. subject matter expert of subject matter experts. You kind of get the 30,000 foot view yeah. of what everyone is doing, where case officers are somewhat tunnel visioned on their particular fiefdom you kind of have the full picture. Because you're reading all the intelligence reports. You're managing, you're disseminating all the intelligence reports. And you're reading SIGINT, signals intelligence. And so you're putting all the piece, pieces of the puzzle together, and, you, and it creates a subject matter expert. And you're you. supposed to be able to travel out and meet sources and yes. do things that other collection uh, uh, agents do. Yes. But that's not what happened. Because I love yeah. this, this quote. Women don't know how to deal with Arabs, is what you were told. Yes, yes, I was told that repeatedly. And, and how many, just before CIA, how many different countries had you traveled to? In, Six. In, yeah. And I had studied abroad uh, for a semester in Cairo as a student. Um, I had been all over the Middle East at that point. And so, yeah, that was a revelation that I would never <laughs> know how to deal with an Arab. So you're, you're able to kind of turn that on its head I in, did. in Iraq later yes. on. So one yes. place that we're allowed to say where you were. Um, and this is certainly not a pleasure deployment either. Uh, this is right before the, right before the Sunni awakening, yeah. uh, a time when there's massive amounts of sectarian violence. So you, even though you deserved to go to St. Croix yeah. or somewhere like that, you yeah. got sent from one hardship deployment to the next. And you refer to Iraq as Groundhog Day, about yeah. just unrelenting sameness every single day. Yes. So it, I always say that probably is the hardest I've ever worked, and I'm likely to never work that hard again. So we were doing 12, 13, 14 hour days. Um, we were handling threat information multiple times a day. So it was just hair on fire, no time to eat, hardly any time to sleep. I mean, couldn't even go to the bathroom. I mean, you'd run to the bathroom, you'd run back. It was constant because you were dealing with the location of a car bomb or the place where they just buried the IED and troops are about to roll over it. And you've got to call that that location of the IED in before somebody gets blown up. So it was just constant and there was no break from this. Right. Meanwhile, you're getting shelled by rockets multiple times a day, so you're diving into bunkers. It's 125 degrees out. It's miserable. It's hot. And you're just exhausted all the time. This is where you got the opportunity to show your mettle, to show what you had, it's particularly with debriefing some of the sources that you had were running in Iraq. And you mentioned in the book that most CIA officers had three strikes against them before they even walked in the war, <laughs> yeah. walked in the door. They're American, of course. They were non-believers, because the vast majority of them were not Muslim, and they were CIA. But you had a fourth. Being a woman, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you had to walk in the door 
not waste any time and set the tone immediately or you're, you're done. Yeah, so it's interesting because um, I like to explain to people that these sources that are penetrations of terrorist groups, so these guys are a part or very close to a terrorist or insurgent group, they, most of them, were incredibly street smart high levels of emotional intelligence. Because this is what it took to survive in a place like Iraq under Saddam Hussein when everyone was reporting on everyone else. So these guys had, were survivors. And so if you walk through that door and you're anything but authentic, they're going to know it immediately. And if you're trying to hide the fact that you don't know the Middle East, they will figure you out immediately. And if they don't trust you, they're not going to give you their intel. It's just that simple. And be, these aren't nice people. Most of these aren't, not. you know, come to Jesus moments. They, they didn't all of a sudden say, I want to help the Americans because I believe in truth, justice, and Superman. Right. No. They had an ulterior motive, maybe even a overt ulterior motive that mm -hmm. was to mess with someone else, a rival, or yeah. to get power or money. So they weren't doing it out of the goodness of their hearts. So you're, these are hardened terrorists, mm -hmm. even went because even though they're helping the United States, it's usually to accomplish something for themselves. Yeah, absolutely. You know, everybody works within their, for their own best interest, and they were no different. Yeah. So Iraq, you learned a lot. You were able to, to do a lot that really showed that you were capable of doing the job. Yeah. And then you guys decided to leave. Leave yeah. CIA. And, and, and after CIA, and you talk a lot about this in the book, it's not all that easy to transition back to Terrifying. the civilian world. Especially after a decade where you're privy to the most secret information in the world, mm -hmm. where on a day-to-day -day basis, like you mentioned, you're doing things that are saving lives or changing mm -hmm. lives, intelligence you collect may be going all the way up to the top. And then, of course, you need to get a new job. And your resume has a 10-year gap in it, basically. Because <laughs> yeah. you can't really talk about all the wonderful things that you've done and the skill sets that you learned. So how do you do that transition? Exactly. <laughs> I mean, so I, I still have um, colleagues that you know really do want to leave, but it's so hard to get out. So technically, you can leave the CIA whenever you want. Um, they don't hold you hostage, or you don't have to put in a certain period of time. But it's especially when you've served for a substantial period, so 10 years for us, you have no resume. You can't say what you've done for, t for 10 years or so. You have no Rolodex of contacts because you've been undercover overseas living in crazy places. So how are you going to even get leads for a job? And Who's going to hire you? And if you're, if you're in a particular position where you need to maintain your cover even after you leave the yeah. CIA, mm -hmm. your resume will say Minister of Shrubberies yeah. for it's whatever so embassy you oversee. Right, so impressive. <laughs> yeah. And you can't say, no, I actually did some really interesting things that might work wink, for your company. Wink, wink, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I worked at Langley, we'll talk about that later. Um, and, and there's a psychological issue involved with this too that you talk about where you are leading a life that has true satisfaction because yeah. you're accomplishing some pretty impressive things yeah. and then going to work for some law firm or some K Street law, but not if you work there, great, but <laughs> going from one to the other does have that, how do you find something that satisfies you the same way? It, yeah, there was a fear. There was a great fear that we had that we, we could never find um, another career that would satisfy us that much. And then, you know, truth be told, you become adrenaline junkies. And so you get used to getting this high off of doing things that uh, are, of, uh, are of national security importance or you're saving lives in the war zones. And so it's very, um, it's very scary to leave. Yeah. But you did find a way to use your training yes. to do uh, pretty amazing things in the outside world. Uh, you had a particular set of skills that applied other places around. And you're able to work uh, for NGOs, for businesses, for people who were doing business in the area of the world that you knew best mm -hmm. to provide threat analysis and security and other things like that too as well. Um, there's a story in this book that is fantastic, that really shows uh, we did a podcast earlier, just to break in, and we didn't talk about this, and we're excited now to get a chance. Just the story is just fantastic. So you're working for a client who was being propositioned by a guy saying, you need to invest in my, my fund. I have amazing returns. And you were there to vet whether or not he was for real. Yes. This man named Sonny. Yes. 
and Sunny showed up. Can you describe the scene about how when you first met Sunny? <laughs> yeah. So it was in Dubai. Anybody in here been to Dubai or the Emirates? Yeah, quite a few. So it was in a swanky bar atop a, a very well-known hotel there. And um, we were all seated, and the idea was, like, we're not going to tell him who you are, what you've done. We're just going to keep it on the down low. But we're going to put you right next to him. And Michelle, we just want you to you know, figure out if this guy is full of it or if he's legit. Because he was. we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars in terms of investments. And so uh, what, uh, he walked into the room, and he filled up the room. Like, so it was like he slid in, you know? And I was he like, winked at the, oh, yeah. at the hostess. And <laughs> he went, this guy was crazy. And I thought, you know what? This is going to be good. When I saw that much ego that fast, I knew he was going to talk. And, and when talked, people talk, and talked. you can get whatever you need out of so them. So the first thing that he said, I believe, was that not only was he a ranger, but he also was a Green Beret. And yes. he used that term, Green Beret. It was a Green Beret. Now, Ranger School is a pain in the ass, <laughs> and Special Forces training is, is dramatically, and that's how like, that's, they wouldn't call themselves a Green Beret usually. Very few people have double tabbed. There are some. There but, are some. Very few. Mm -hmm. And then he talked about all his work in Afghanistan. Yeah. But he couldn't tell me which agency he worked for. He couldn't give me any Afghan names, not that I knew them, but I was asking anyway, trying to act real smart on that. <laughs> and then yeah. he said something he probably wished he didn't. Yeah. Oh, but I, work, I worked at Langley. <laughs> yeah, so I was really pushing hard, and to the point that if you, if you watch nonverbals, he was sweating, he was pulling at his collar, you know? It's called the hangman's noose in the CIA, where you're like, I don't like that question. He was like squirming in his chair. I had him exactly where I wanted him. And then, so because he was so nervous, he's like, I gotta figure out a way out of this. So he's, he's kind of like, well, I can't answer all your questions, because I work for Langley. And I was like, oh, he did not just say that. <laughs> I think like, he did not just say that. Because, <laughs> by the way, we never say Langley. So it was, a, it was like an immediate giveaway that, I mean, of course, that he had never worked for the CIA. And he was telling a former CIA agent he had. I was like, oh, do tell. <laughs> tell me about that. You got a nice free meal out of it, at least. Well, so, we yes. did, and, and so much fun. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but we ended up, you know, afterwards for fun, I wrote up like a five page assessment on this guy and um, handed it to my friend. He was like, wow. And I said, so if he did all the things he said he had done in his life, he must have started his illustrious career at the age of seven. <laughs> so we were pretty sure he, Sonny was not legit. Yeah. So you enjoyed yourselves, you had some fun. Uh taking away some stolen valor from, from everything. I mean, because the guy claimed you worked for everyone. Oh, so, yeah, yeah. From special ops to CIA. Uh, and then you had a pretty extraordinary opportunity come to you where, uh, as ISIS was on the move throughout the Middle East, uh, displacing persons throughout, people who are unwilling to bend the knee to their form of fundamentalism. In many cases, these were Christians who were, or displaced persons who would have been uh, at the brunt end of ISIS brutality. Yeah. And opportunity came together with uh, skill set in this case, where someone people may have heard of, I mean, in Mark Burnett, if you've watched Survivor or anything like that, the producer that's behind that, along with his wife, came, brought a small team together mm -hmm. and said, we need to do something about this. And then you, of course, on the, you and your husband, on the other hand, were the ones with the particular set of skills <laughs> that can be brought to bear. And this, to, to my mind, this brings up that, that juxtaposition we talked about in the beginning, where plans and the ability to be adaptive kind of come together. Yes. Because you have, on one hand, a, a massive bureaucracy, as we'll talk about, a country that's willing to take in these, these displaced persons, and then this ad hoc, thrown together group of people from all different walks of life mm -hmm. that have the abilities, the money, the skill sets to do something about it. Yeah, it was so fascinating because it, it was kind of a model for a new way of doing things. The fact that you could bring together people with special skill sets and um, it's not a company, it's not an organization, but you have a shared common cause. So what can we do as a group to try to uh, rescue these people and, and find a country willing to take them in? And um, 
And then once, you know, Joseph ran around God's green earth trying to meet with um, presidents, prime ministers, ministers of interior, and getting told no, 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 we, we finally found Slovakia. And so what was so fascinating about Slovakia was we had to help at once they said yes, which was a, a big deal, it was a miracle. Um, we had to help them work their bureaucracy um, in order to ev affect this evacuation. Well, it was, to me, I laughed out loud because Slovakia had the infrastructure set up, they had the money from NGOs, they had the money from other organizations. They were ready to do it, they're like, we can't because we, we don't have a way to vet these refugees. We don't have a way to sit them down and figure out if they're bad guys or not. Ta -da. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I love vetting like nobody's business. So I love meeting with people and like Sunny and, and figuring out if they're legit or not. I love combing through mountains of information to find the gold nuggets. I love uh, vetting to be sure that we're getting good stuff and not fabricated intelligence. So you know that's kind of our thing. Because I mean, so th these groups that were trying to escape ISIS, this could have been a breeding ground for not only. ISIS people who are trying to slip into Europe, but for any type of unscrupulous people. Sure. You have con men everywhere, you have scumbags everywhere, and you want to make sure that the people who are really running for their lives yeah. get the opportunity to get out. So that meant yeah. you had to go back to Iraq. Yeah, yeah. again, I, I say throughout the book, never say never, because every time I did, Right around the corner was that thing, and I had said, yeah, I'm, once we left Baghdad, I was like, I'll never go back to Iraq again. <laughs> and there we were, back to Iraq. Um, but it was, so, it was so fascinating because we wanted to be sure that we were not bringing in anybody in this group that could, that could pose a security threat to the receiving country. And we had to be absolutely certain of that. And we had to stand before the Minister of Interior and say, we're not going to bring in anybody here who's going to blow you up or, or um, rob people or you know, no criminal elements and all of that. We've, we've done our work. We've done our jobs to vet these people and make sure they really are the neediest people who need a new home. And, and in a bit of a sunny redo, you have a situation where people don't know who you are that you're, you're, yeah. you're interviewing. And I, I don't want to use the word do-gooders, but I'll use the word do-gooders. I mean, you might have that perception of, this person works for a charity or an NGO, they're trying to save the world, I can get one over on them, right? I've been scamming people like this my whole life, and yeah. you and your husband are sitting in front of them saying, we want to help you, we want to get you to a better life, and yeah. they think they can take advantage of you. Sure. But as, again, you have a particular set of skills that they weren't necessarily preparing for. Right, right, it was so useful, um, but it was also so intense having uh, hundreds of conversations with people who, had been displaced by ISIS. Their, their villages had been surrounded by ISIS and they were choked, they were cut off. So they weren't receiving water or supplies. And um, they had already seen what ISIS had done to the Yazidi villages. So they had taken, the you know, it killed the men and then raped the woman and took them as booty, you know, as prize, um, forced marriage and all of that. And they knew it was coming and so when um, so the Kurds had been holding the village for a long period of time, and then the Kurds at some point just said, we can't hold it anymore, heads up, we're leaving tonight. And that night is when hundreds of thousands of Christians left their ancient villages and just made a run for Kurdistan. And so that's, of course, where we, where we went to affect the evacuation. And after you'd done the vetting, after you had collected a lot of the documentation, your husband Joseph went to Slovakia because they now had a separate problem. They had the vetting taken yeah. care of, but they said, we're all ready to go. We're ready to receive, but we don't know, we don't have any Christians. Yeah, so they, did, they didn't know what we had done in Iraq. And they're like, we really want to do this, but we've been ready for this for about six months, but we couldn't find anyone to help. Really? So Joseph takes a suitcase full of all the vetting documents, you know, brings it up to the table and he's like, I got your Christians right there. And they're like, you got what? <laughs> and so we had, we were able to say, not only did we do the vetting, but we brought all the documentation here to you. Take a look at what we've got. And they were pretty amazed. It would have taken them probably at least a year to do that on their own. And, and that's just one element of this because you physically have to get the people out. Yeah. Right, so it's one thing if Slovakia is ready to receive, and they, at that point they were, but you have to get them physically from where they are in essentially a displaced persons camp mm -hmm. to the airport to fly them to Slovakia. Yeah. 
that was much more difficult than you thought it was going to be. Oh my goodness. Um, so this was a period of time when Russia was sending cruise missiles over Iraqi airspace into Syria against ISIS. So the Iraqis had to close all of northern Iraq airspace. So it, basically the whole evacuation was thrown off. We couldn't get into Iraq at first. And then after about uh, 24 hours, they reopened the airports. We made our way you know, halfway across the world from central Florida to Kurdistan. And then hours before the evacuation, they did it again. They shut down airspace for more cruise missiles, and the whole entire evacuation was completely thrown off. Because now we didn't have a plane, and we had no way to get them out. And it's not like you have time to kill. ISIS is down the street at this yeah, point. Yeah, it was like about 40 miles away, yeah. the front lines with ISIS. It's the Russians. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so uh, amazingly, all of this was captured by 2020 for a special. I mean, had it not gotten on camera, you just I wouldn't have believed it. E even watching it myself, I was like, I cannot believe what we went through to make this happen. Um, but miraculously, we were able to finally locate an airplane willing to fly into a war zone, what was considered an active war zone at that point, and fly our people out of Kurdistan to Slovakia. Let me, let me ask you a question about right now. We, we talked about this earlier. We'll talk about it a little bit again now. The, the, how, why was this so difficult? Because there are agencies, international agencies and in governmental agencies that should be doing this. I mean, I work with the UNHCR, High Commission for Refugees in the Balkans in the 1990s. They seem to be doing an okay job. But the amount of backlog, the amount of time it takes to actually take someone out of a war zone like this and bring them somewhere safe is dramatically longer than these people have. Five, 10 years, yeah, on average. And it takes far too long, which is the same thing with the United States. Our vetting process, our clearance process for visitor visas as well as resident visas takes far too long. It takes years at a time sometimes. So we have to do a much better job at um, figuring out how to get through that, that bureaucratic process and streamline the process. Hire the people that actually know how to do vetting. Conduct better training of your officers. So we as the United States could be doing a much better job. And UNHCR, you know, they're representing and they're vetting for countries all over the world. So the idea is if it takes longer, it must be better. That's simply, it shouldn't be that way. And yeah, because these people are in very desperate situations. So they're living in refugee camps for five, 10 years. Well, and you use the word refugee, and we can't even use the word refugee because that one layer of bureaucracy is someone with a refugee status is dramatically different than someone with the IDP, IDP status. Yeah. And that determined you had to coach these young Iraqi people that they couldn't call themselves refugees because they wouldn't be able to escape so if they call themselves refugees. Even just going to the airport for people who have never flown in their lives was very dicey because we knew at any point that Iraqi authorities could become suspicious and say, we don't know what you're up to, but we don't like it. And that's all you need in the Middle East to shut something down. So we had to like coach them the night before and pretend like we were officers asking questions. And we kept saying, are you refugees? And they'd say, yes. And we're like, no, you're not refugees. Because they weren't. They're internally displaced people with valid passports and valid visas who had the right to travel. Had they been refugees, that's a whole different story. So we're like, no, you're not a refugee. So the whole time we were at the airport, I was just like, nobody say you're a refugee. So I myself, like, I stood at the check-in counter, and I was trying to deflect the attention of the people checking us in and, and all the employees of the airport they, who kept saying, are you sure these people aren't refugees? And I'm like, oh yeah, I'm absolutely positive. Why are a bunch of Americans then here helping them? Like, oh, we're just really good friends and we're just taking these people on a nice holiday in Europe. <laughs> They're just carrying everything they own yeah, with all their yeah. families. They have these huge <laughs> carts full of them. <laughs> Something about this picture doesn't look right. Well, and again, it's just this concept of, you know, refugees status, and you're basically giving them one day trade craft training yeah. on yeah. pretend you're something that you're not. And because, how to act under pressure. Right, because yeah. that red tape, just that simple word, yeah. can, can mean life or death. It can throw off the whole evacuation. Yeah. Well, and again, take that to the next step. Throwing off the evacuation could basically doom some of these people 
to dying at the hands of ISIS. Yeah, I mean, what's so very hard is a lot of them were under the impression after Mosul was liberated and after a lot of these villages have been liberated in northern Iraq that they could go home. And I mean, we were hopeful for these hundreds of thousands, millions of people who are displaced in Iraq. They can't go home. ISIS has completely obliterated these areas. And these people are willing to live in really rough circumstances. I mean, it's your home. It doesn't matter if the roof is gone. We can rebuild the roof. But they have destroyed all of the infrastructure. So water, simple things like water or food, you just, yeah, they can't go back. So they're still stuck. And that's not, I mean, it's one thing, like if I moved to Canada, I'd be OK. I'd have to learn some French, but I'd get by. But going from Iraq to Slovakia, where Slovak is not a language that's probably taught at a lot of schools in Iraq. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. and the, 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 the European culture is completely different. Mm -hmm. The climate is somewhat different. Right. And they don't have any discernible skills. Talk about leaving the CIA, not being able to get a job, being yeah. displaced to Slovakia. You're basically doing manual labor. Mm -hmm. It's not an easy life. And you even argued, you told some of them, that this life may actually be harder than the one that you're leaving. We actually said, Joseph and I said this numerous times to them, please understand that it might be more difficult for you to integrate into this new country than it is to deal with ISIS. And they looked at us like we were nuts. But then a couple of months into Slovakia, they're like, we don't know if we can do this. We want to go home, no matter what that threat is. So I really try to express to people who want to support refugees, it is they're going through such trauma. I mean, they've already been through such trauma. And now the trauma of trying to start a new life in a place. I mean, imagine suddenly being dropped into Tokyo and having to learn Japanese, going to school in Japanese, working in Japanese. I mean, I don't know that I could do it. So I mean, I really understood and continue to understand that great struggle. Well, you hinted at this a little bit. Let me, let me wrap up with this question. You, know, you, you talked about the fact that you know, you're able to transition to the civilian workforce because you're incredibly well educated. You had 10 years of the CIA under your belt. You knew all this trade craft. And you were able to help these people because of that, right? Because yeah. you, you could yeah. vet them, and you had the power, and you understood the Middle East and how things work. For those out there that don't have a decade of CIA training and want to do something, is there anything that can be done by the average person to help any of these refugees from the Middle East? Yes, that's what's so exciting. Because there are so many now pockets of refugees all over the United States. And there are churches and mosques and community groups that are providing services and help to them. And they welcome community support. And you know, a lot of Americans, we're, we're scared to get in people's business. But these people are from a lot of cultures where they want you to be, they're very community oriented. They want you to get in their business. They want you to ask about their stories, where they come from. They want you to take them to the grocery store and teach them how to use a, a you know, credit card machine to pay for your groceries, um, how to pump gas. I mean, there's, there's so many different things they've never been exposed to. And, um, Simple things like helping their children register in the elementary school is life changing for them. So again, it doesn't take much. You just need to be a normal person with a little bit of empathy and a little bit of time and, and, a, and a little bit can go a very long way for them. <laughs> well, that seems to be a perfect time to move over to any kind of questions that you may have from the audience. Now, since we want to pick it up, obviously, our microphone issues, Amanda, has a microphone, so raise your hand if you want to ask a question. She'll come to you with the mic, uh, and then you can ask your question for Michelle. Anyone? I've got more if you don't have any. <laughs> I always have questions, but this is your opportunity if you want to ask something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who's going to be bright? There it is, right here. Yeah. Um, af Hello. Um, after you left, um, I would assume that they gave you somewhat of a debriefing on asking you like why you're leaving and things like that. Um, the, uh, your shaking of the head is important for a lot of people in this room, by the <laughs> no, way. No, they didn't. Um, the second thing is um, you mentioned uh, how women were perceived in the, in the, in the CIA. Um, and <clears throat> uh, given that they didn't give you an exit interview, essentially, uh, how are they going to ever change, given that they clearly need more women, they probably need more minorities, oh, they yes. need people who can speak other languages. 
And if you have the 1950s mentality in anything today, yeah. I don't see how you're going to survive. How, how do you see the CIA actually actually changing such um, that it can actually It's going to be help? painful. And it's going to be painful. And it's going to have to come from really strong individuals who have the confidence to be who they are. I mean, the CIA right now is simply disadvantaged by a lack of diversity on every level. And so if you're going to reach, if you're going to collect intelligence in different cultures, you need people who speak different languages. You need people who understand those cultures. You need people of all backgrounds and sizes and shapes who can blend and, and, and get around. So how are we going to do it? I, I'm hoping that when I write blog pieces or when I speak publicly that I'm speaking to maybe the next generation of people who will eventually get into the CIA and have, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be a struggle. Um, the CIA has, uh, is, is behind, behind the game. So maybe I can get in front of leaders at some point and encourage them to, to try to change um, the way we do hiring and, and the way we do vetting to improve that process. Operational tempo doesn't help that much either because right. you, know, you have young people who are being burned out by the pace of yeah. deployments uh, that, that aren't allowing, like we talked about earlier, for a 30-year CIA career right. and someone who might be, like Michelle, work her way up to be the Deputy Director of Operations at one point or the DCIA at one point, might leave after 10 years or five right. years because they were deployed to terrible redacted country and then Iraq back to back yeah. and just yeah. say, this is enough. I just can't do this anymore. Yeah. And so my concern is that, so the, the generation above me, they were in the CIA their whole career. Then my generation, we came in around 9-11. And so a lot of us had very difficult careers, war zone, difficult place, difficult place. And so for us, after 10 years, Joseph and I were exhausted. Um, I'm fearful that the next generation, I don't, is going to, in one sense, it's good because they're going to take less, you know, <coughs> crap from the superiors. You know, they're going to say, like, I'm not going to stick with this. Unfortunately, that's going to mean we're not going to have a, a depth of expertise within the CIA. And we need people who can stick around long enough to enact those changes. So that's, that's a huge challenge. Hello, my name is Kirk Pyros. I'm from the American Studies Program. I wanted to know, what was the process like for you to begin speaking about your experiences? What inspired you to do that? And did you have to go through, I mean, obviously you had to go through a bunch of clearance to be able to talk about this issue. So what was that process like? And what are the fruits you've seen from speaking out about it? So um, I, for me, it was a spiritual calling to share my story to inspire others. And so I knew when I felt that calling that I couldn't do it in pseudonym. I would have to do it in true name, which meant I would have to leave the agency and I would have to drop cover. But the agency doesn't have to say yes. So I started writing the book initially in faith that they would let me drop cover. And they did. And so everything that I speak about, everything that's in the book, um, everything that I say on radio, TV, or podcasts, or things like this has to be cleared. And um, it's amazing what they'll actually let, you, <laughs> actually let you say, except for where you actually served. Um, but the feedback has been so tremendous. And even though there's a risk of coming out and saying I'm former CIA, there's a definite risk attached to that. Um, it's so worth it when you can give people hope to do the hard things in life. Because I'm a really big believer that it's in the toughest spaces that we find out what our strengths are and we can have the greatest impact. So do the hard things. And if I can give people the courage to walk through doors that scare the pants off them, then that makes it worth it for me. And, and uh, that's what gets me out of bed every day. Michelle, I, I can't tell you my name. That's a secret. But uh, <laughs> did you ever work with any ministries um, from the US who in helped integrate uh, some of the refugees? No, no, we haven't worked on this end with integration issues, no. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. Let me follow up with that. Uh, just on an individual yeah. basis. So like we, we have friends who have um, okay. that was come to the United States. So like as a family, we help out, but we've never done that at like on a large scale per se. 
Have you ever heard of Voice of the Martyrs? Yes, of course. Okay. So pre-CIA, um, my husband did human rights work, and he worked with a lot of organizations such as Voice of the Martyr. You mentioned risk of, I guess, um, talking about being former CIA. Can you explain what those risks are? So um, I think there's any risk at becoming a public personality. So putting yourself out there as a singer or an actor, there's a general risk because you kind of got crazy people all over the place. Um, but I'm also cognizant that as a former uh, U.S. government official, former counterterrorism officer, that um, if I'm in uh, public places or I'm doing book signings, there's a very real risk that somebody could walk in who's a lone wolf, who's an extremist or a crazy person. They bring in a gun. That's, that's a problem. So that's the kind of risk that's always in the back of my mind. And so when we're doing public events now, we're, we're having to get security and we're having to make sure bags are checked before people walk in the door. How much, how much risk is there for your former contacts that, that you're out? Uh, is, I mean, has, Colleagues or? No, no, I mean, people, people overseas who you work with, is there any, any fear? Obviously, the CIA wouldn't have allowed you to go out with your normal name if there was. But isn't that a concern that when someone drops their cover that anyone that they had worked with overseas, anyone they had recruited, anyone that they had had any kind of contact with, yeah. they're tainted automatically now that everyone knows that you're CIA. So yeah, when you go through the clearance process, they make sure that that's not the case. <laughs> <laughs> A concise answer, yeah, like, yes. Look, how, how much did your family know beyond your husband, who obviously knew what you did for a job? <laughs> did, did your parents know? Did your friends know? And how much decision, is there are certain laws that regulate what you can tell other people, but common sense plays a role in this also. Yeah, so uh, when you're hired by the CIA, they say, you are allowed to tell your family, and, but you need to be sure they can bear the burden of this secret, and they can keep your secret for you. If that's the rest of your life, it's the rest of your life and their life. Um, I knew my family could handle the secret, so I told my parents, they're sitting on the front row here, my sister who's right behind them, and my niece, and my best friend Stephanie, they always knew where we were, what we were really doing, and they, they kept that secret for us. And um, you know, having even a core people of behind, you know, behind back here in the United States praying for us um, really, I think, kept us from really bad things happening. So we were very grateful for their love and support. And that carried certainly over until your, your post work. As a historian, what I found fascinating is, and this is where I'm gonna age myself a little bit, these kids these days <laughs> are, are leaving us a historical record that doesn't, I mean, so much better than what was in the past. And you have an example of this where when you were making this move yeah. from the camp to the airport, <laughs> there's this magical historic record of your, your texts and emails and, and calls back and forth that is like almost a TikTok or a, a, a schedule yeah. of every moment going through. The flight was canceled, the flight's back on, we're through security, we're here, we're there. Yes. And to me, it's a historical document. Yeah, so I actually had to go back and put the pieces of that puzzle together because we were under such stress. I couldn't remember which day was Tuesday, Wednesday, what happened when. And so I took the photographs with the time date stamps on them, the text, the emails, and I put them all together. And um, it was very helpful for me as I was uh, you know, remembering all that and writing about it in the book. Um, otherwise, I couldn't have kept all that straight. Write everything down, which is the opposite of unless it's secret, yes. in which case don't. <laughs> you know, any further questions? Yeah, right behind you, Amanda. Yeah. Hi. Um, so, what was it like on your marriage? Um, was it like per se, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, or um, how is it uh, spiritually based as well? So, I was so grateful to have Joseph by my side because. I don't think I could have gotten through that level of stress without him as my rock, and probably he would say the same. I mean, obviously, 10 years of that, you know, working every day, 
constantly looking for hostile surveillance, meaning somebody about to ambush you or attack you, um, took its toll on us. Definitely was hard on our marriage, especially towards the end. But it, it, it also strengthened our marriage because, I mean, you are the only ones who know what you've been through together. I mean, you're, we know things about each other that no one will ever understand fully. And so to have a spouse by your side helping to keep you safe, I was so grateful. And the other thing I just have to praise Joseph on was the fact that it's Joseph who taught me the intricacies of Arab culture that I needed to do my job well. It's stuff you can't learn in a textbook. You can't learn in a classroom. But I would pepper Joseph with a 1,000 questions like, so when they say this, what do they actually mean? Or what are they thinking when they say A, B, C? And so <laughs> bless his heart, like we say in the South, he, he, had, to, he had to answer a lot of questions. When you worked together at times, you didn't want people to know that you were married. How difficult was it? Oh. And you tell a great story in the book. You don't have to go through the whole story. Buy the book and you can read it. But there, there's a great story about this, how, how difficult it was to not let on that you were married. So now you're watching your own nonverbals because you don't want to look, you know, because you're with your spouse. So, you know, everything is, you're so comfortable and so familiar. And I'm like, act like you don't know Joseph very well, you know? <laughs> but we both had the same ring on. And Joseph's like, take your ring off. Um, so uh, and then it was very awkward at times when we were um, meeting with the source together and trying to hide the fact, obviously, that we're married, because that's too much information for a terrorist to know. But Joseph was placed in weird positions where the guy was like hitting on, the terrorist was hitting on me. <laughs> this is very wrong. You didn't have a terrorist be like, you two should date. Yeah. Like, you have some chemistry between the two of you. That, yeah. that was not yes. embarrassing at all. <laughs> uh, was there a last question? I saw a hand halfway go up before the last, there it is, yep. No, yeah, something too. Is there a story that maybe is not in the book that you found yourself at a place where you just realized, I will remember this for the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, in order to get from BIAP, the airport, to the CIA compound, we had to take helicopters. Uh, the CIA took helicopters and flew us, skimmed right over the tops of buildings. And the idea was that insurgents couldn't see you coming and like shoot you out of the sky. But um, and, and so we would only uh, fly uh, between compound and the airport at night. And so you would, you know, you'd make this grand trip from Washington, D.C. to Iraq. You get to the airport, and then you get on these helos. But it was during curfew. So it was the one time when it was quiet. There were no people on the streets. It was just quiet. And I would sit next, I would try to sit next to the gunner so I could see out the door. And it was like my only real glimpse of Baghdad because the rest of the time we were stuck in the green zone on the compound. And I'm like, this is what Baghdad looks like. Get your, you know, look while you can. And I probably should have been really scared, um, but I wasn't. I was fascinated. And Andy, in those moments, I was like, how did I get here? Like, well, you're sitting, how did that happen? You're sitting next to a guy with a machine gun and night vision and goggles, ready to, <laughs> and you're like, how did I get here? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, so that was a surreal moment. Like, yeah, I never imagined. Yeah. Uh, up here, sorry, man, to make you come all the way up. Uh, just to pick up on your kids these days theme. <laughs> <laughs> um, kids can't seem to shut up on social media anymore. So how hard is it going to be to recruit them to the CIA when they rejected you for unknown reasons? It's going to be really hard. Because also, it's really hide, hard to hide if you've done things wrong, right? Because there's a record online. So that's a really good point. I think it's going to make it much more difficult um, to hire the next generation. And then even something as simple as the drug issue you know, now, you know, marijuana is legalized in some states and not others. And so now, you know, because we were a polygraph, you know, have you ever mi you know, misused drugs or used illegal drugs? How are they going to ask that question now? I don't know. Let me, let me jump up on that, too. This is several years ago that you were vetting these people to come into Europe. But nowadays, how can you use social media as a vetting process? Because it seems like people, if they're not refugees running from their lives from ISIS, but if they're people coming from more industrialized places, you know, Damascus or, or where sure. they have, yeah. possibly have social media profiles, 
can this be used for vetting as well? Absolutely, yeah, great vetting tools. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and, and, and we think of vetting as being so complicated, but something as simple as when a refugee walks up and says, like, I have no documentation to the UN person, that's a massive red flag. Because in the Middle East, in Arab culture, it is incredibly uh, important, even more important in the United States, to have all your paperwork together. So even our internally displaced persons, they had before they ran from their, you know, their homes, they brought their paperwork with them. So of course there are legitimate cases where someone you know, lost their paperwork or their passport or their, their ID along the way, but generally speaking, Arabs treat their, their paperwork and their documentation with great care. Uh, straight behind you, Amanda. Uh, what would be an advice you would give to young women just entering the workforce or women who are working in like a very male dominated workforce? So um, my advice would be to figure out what you're really passionate about and get really good at it. Whatever that thing is, because um, in order to break the glass ceilings, you have to demonstrate your knowledge, your expertise. And, and sometimes, <laughs> Oftentimes, we have to work much harder than others to do that. But the way that I broke through was by getting really good in terms of my knowledge of Arab culture. So for me, that's what made the difference. So I would just say, find that thing, and then do everything you can to build up your knowledge on that topic or that skill. Got one back. Um, so, so I'm curious, I know that your faith plays such an instrumental role in your work. Can you talk a little bit about the, um, the intersection between the Muslim culture in which you were existing and the faith that you held so personally? Yeah, so um, my faith is for me very foundational for the decisions I make in my life and what I do with my life. And so um, for me, I felt that God had opened the door for me to do this very unorthodox um, career. Um, being in the Middle East as a Christian, what was useful about that is, you know, you're taught to have empathy for others and try to, to see e others, um, to try to understand other people better. And so that, that empathy was really critical both in the workplace as well as just getting around. And um, it also helped me to, you know, for the first time in my life, I was a minority. You know, so I could understand what it feels like to be the only whatever in the room. And so now I have more empathy for minorities in other locations, because now I've, I've felt what that feels like to be the, the, the weird or the different one. Yeah. I mean, you were like a quadruple minority some places. <laughs> yeah. the, the American, the yeah. woman, Christian. Yes, yes, indeed, yeah. yeah. Is your signing hands stretched out, so I think you're going to be signing some books in a minute or two. Um, please join me in thanking Michelle Rigby Assad for, for taking the time to talk to us here tonight. We truly appreciate it. And if you're willing to stick around and do a little signing in the back. Um, the book, uh, you know, I'm paid to say the books are good, um, but every so often I get to say it honestly. Um, I, I did truly enjoy this. I, I actually, I literally read it in about four hours just kind of sat down and, and it's it's very narrative it's not you're not reading you know something that you're going to be like oh i gotta read another chapter and the stories we didn't we didn't give them anywhere near the kind of justice we needed to uh one day they're going to make for a hell of a screenplay uh because the, the the harrowing trek to the airport is extraordinary the sunny story had me just laughing out loud so if you have the chance which you all do uh grab this book because it's certainly worth having Thank, Thank you, you so much. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for coming.